We're going to cover the basics of root locus and in this first part we are going to talk about how to set up the drawing for it and we're going to draw this on the S plane. And before we actually start drawing the root locus itself, we have to understand our pole equation here a little bit more. And we're going to start with just uh, an expression. So the expression for G and H, if we say that G of H, we'll just lump them together. So you multiply them together, you get some expression. That expression will have some numerator as a function of S and some denominator as a function of S. So we want to look at our poles here. And so if we plug this equation into our pole equation, you get 1 plus k times, now we're just substituting this in. So it'll be some numerator expression in terms of s and some denominator expression. And this has to be equal to 0 to evaluate the poles. Now, we usually want to get rid of any s's in the denominator. So we can multiply this whole expression by d of s. And then we can solve it here. So here we have our k times n s equals 0. So we can get it in this form. And remember our denominator here, these, are the, these would be the zeros, sorry, the poles of the systems. So these would represent the poles. And the numerator represents the zeros of this system here. And what we're going to do is we're going to vary k starting from 0 and off into infinity. Look at this equation though. Think for a second. What if k is equal to 0? So if k is equal to 0, our expression simply becomes d of s is equal to 0. Right? So the poles of this system, of our g times h, the poles of that system are the system, the poles of our closed loop system. Okay? Then, if, let's take the other extreme, so if k goes to infinity, so if the k is, goes to infinity here, these are essentially going to become completely be ignored, and then k dominates and all we have is n of s is going to be equal to 0. Okay, and these, this is the numerator, so these are the poles, sorry, the zeros. These are the zeros, and these are the poles. The other example we give, these are the poles of our gh here, and this, these are the zeros. So in a sense, if k is 0, the poles of this thing are our closed loop poles. Okay? And if k is infinitely high, the zeros of this system become our closed looped poles. So we're going to use those as one, our starting point. So when k equals 0, we're going to start from this point, from, k, from the poles of our gh, and we're going to end because we're going to take k from 0 all the way to infinity, and we're going to end at the zeros of the system. Okay, so we're going to draw that on our S map. So, say we have, I'm just going to make an arbitrary example here. So if we started when we had uh, an X, a pole, pole from original system here, and we had a zero here, this would be our starting point and our end point. Also note that we're going to have a bunch of different lines going through here. So this line will look like, like this. That's one branch is what we call it. So this is a branch. Oops. Branch. And the number of branches for a system is equal to the number of closed loop poles. So if we have it's the closed loop, right? so it's this full expression. So if we have one, we'll have one branch. If we have 20, we'd have 20 different branches. So we have 20 different lines that are going to map from k value equaling 0 to infinity. Okay, so this is the basics. The important things that you need to remember here are the number of branches that we're going to see 
are the number of closed loop poles. And we start at the poles, so poles of, and I'll just write it here again, G, S, H, S. That's where we start. And we end at the zeros of our G, S, H, S equation. Okay. Now let's take an example. So let's do a very simple example of, this is the equation for G and times H here. Just S minus one divided by S plus three. So first thing we need to do, remember we need to find our starting point and our end point. So to do that, we look for the poles and zeros of our G times H expression. So here it is. Our zero, we can see easily, is one, positive one. And our pole is at negative three. Okay. I know this would be a stable function on its own, so it's good to know. And so what we'll do first is here's our S plane. And we will simply draw those two points on the plane. So we'll start with our zero at one and call us one of our zero here. And then at negative three, so one, two, three. So I'll put it up here. Negative three, we put our pole. And let's check the number of branches. Well, in this system, we're going to have just one pole. And if you're not quite convinced of that, let's actually multiply it out. So if we did this multiplication out, and I'm gonna skip one step, um, but so we, would, we know that with this denominator would be multiplied and end up over here. So we're gonna do that S plus three, right? The pole, the denominator of this expression, plus K times the numerator, S minus one is equal to zero. And so here the highest order is S, here the highest order of S. And so our number of poles in the closed loop system is simply one, okay? And note, the most of the time we are dealing with proper functions. So usually it will be the same magnitude as uh, the denominator here. But if you're not sure, you can always go through this and check. Okay, so here we have just one pole. So we will have number of branches, one closed loop pole, so we'll have one branch. Okay, so we've followed these rules, looks great. So we've drawn this on our S plane. Now the next question is, what path does this take? We know we start here and we end here. But which path do we go on? Do we go straight across? Do we go up and over? Do we go down? Do we go all around the, the map and eventually end up there? That's a good question. That's the slightly harder one to explain. I'll tell you the answer. What we're gonna do is end up just going straight across the real axis here. And so that will actually end up being your root locus path. And usually you draw some little arrow just to indicate, but we draw the X for the start, meaning the, the pole of the, the system and the zero, so you know which way it's going based on the X and the zero position. But I'm gonna to try to explain this, it's a little bit hard. But the other thing that we need to remember is, we derived this last time, the angle of this expression, so G of S, H of S, has to be equal to 180 degrees. So the path that we have to take is constrained to this. It has to meet this constraint, essentially. So our path here, our real value, so if we pick any real value here in between these two val between negative three and one, if we put that into our equation, we'll actually see that we'll get a 180 value out. So let's just take a test point first to just try to understand it. Let's take this negative one as our value. So let's let S equal negative one. And we're gonna throw that into our equation here. And we'll get negative one minus one over one, negative one plus three. So we'll get a negative two over positive two, which is negative one. That looks good. This is actually the magnitude that we need. So we need negative one and we see the angle is going in the negative direction, right? So it's 180. So this satisfies this constraint. And actually, if you test every single real point on here, they will also satisfy that constraint between those two values. So then you know that this constraint is satisfied 
and that is the path it will take. Another thing that we can look at, and this is a little bit confusing to explain, I'll give it my best go here. We can look at these two points. So I'll try to draw it here. So if we want to test a point, what we can do is take a point and if we look at what this means, so say this is S, say this is, I'm just going to arbitrarily say it's negative 1 minus or plus 2J, so just some point, and we want to test it, we can plug it into this equation, into here, and it'll split out our value and we can figure out the angle and the magnitude of it. Um, and here we're looking for the magnitude, or sorry, the angle, right, it has to cons follow this constraint, and you can see if it, if it meets this or not. Another way to visualize it is if you kind of go back to your vector math, this s minus 1 is actually the same as if you put this point in here, it's the vector from this point, this pole, I'm oh, sorry, that's the s minus 1, it's actually be this one, this pole to that point, and since s is the same, we also look at this vector. So it's the vector from the pole to the point that you're trying to test. And that vector, one has a magnitude and also has a pole. Sorry, magnitude and an angle. Okay, so this has an angle here, some value, and this also has an angle here, some other value. And when we, if we wanted to divide two values, so say we have, I'm not going to give the actual value, just alpha and some angle, theta 1, and we have a beta and some angle, theta 2. If we want to evaluate these, we would get alpha over beta, and we actually end up subtracting the angles, so theta 1 minus theta 2. So if we look at this value, so if we have, we had this value, and we subtract this value, in order for the angles to work out, it has to be exactly 180. If you go through the math of this, you'll find that it will not not be 180 for any of these values outside. So it is only true for the values on the real axis. So if we just do this math one more time for this test point here. So if we look at the distance here, so the vector from negative 3 to this negative 1, it is value 2, magnitude, right? So 2 units. And the angle is 0 because it's pointing in this direction to this point. Okay? Let's look at the other one. So the magnitude from now this to this point, so it goes this way, it is also 2, but its angle is negative 180, or 180, it doesn't really matter, they're the same. So we'll say it's positive. So if we evaluate this further, we'll get 1, we subtract these two angles, negative 180 degrees, Negative 180 is the same as positive 180, and so this satisfies this constraint. And if you go through, you'll see that that is true for every single point on here, but if you just move up just a little bit, it will no longer be true. So that <laughs> is, if you followed my explanation, how you can show that this path between these two has to be on the real axis. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, but this, so the line that we drew here, so this blue line, starting at negative 3, which is the pole of our g times h, straight line to the 0, which was at positive 1, this in itself is the root locus, and it would go from the left to the right here, from our starting point to our end point.